We are immensely honored and privileged to introduce Shri Tushar Pradhan, Chief Investment Officer, HSBC Asset Management India Private Limited, as keynote speaker for the inaugural session. Shri Tushar Pradhan ji has over 26 years of experience in various roles over his career. He is an MBA in investment finance, having graduated from the University of Hartford, Connecticut, USA in 1992. He is responsible for all investment activities and strategies across asset classes, equity, fixed income, and multi-asset class. Prior to joining HSBC AMC in June 2009, Tushar has also worked in investment positions in the United States before returning to India. In India, he has worked with HDFC Asset Management and more recently, with AIG Global Asset Management in senior asset management roles. We welcome you, sir, and request our Dean Academics, Dr. Samar Sarabhai, extend green welcome to Dr. Mr. Tushar. Um, Mr. Tushar, we welcome you, and this is the way we welcome all our guests, uh, the green welcome, wherein a tree has been planted in your name in Sundarbans, and you track the growth of the tree by tracking the uh, number given beneath the certificate. So we welcome you again, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. I invite you, sir, for your keynote address. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shubha. Uh, my extreme pranams and gratitude to all of uh, you here present. Uh, Dr. Prabhat, uh, of course, uh, Sarajan has really made the uh, the entire presentation in such a wonderful way that I think the rest of the conference will probably take you from all of the aspects that he uh, touched upon. Uh, my role as a keynote speaker should always be a keynote, not the entire orchestra itself. So the first thing I would like to convey to all of uh, the assembled, including the dear students who have spent so much time sitting in that room there, uh, that my address will be brief. Uh, it will only be a key. To the rest of the music that will be played over the next three years, uh, three days. And I think uh, it's a wonderful orchestra, orchestra which has been put together. Uh, I will not dwell upon it so much, but just to highlight the fact that I wish to congratulate Dr. Sharad Jakuria uh, because such a theme to be put together at such an early stage of this transition that we are talking about uh, is, is an immense uh, uh, you know, feature of that dedication of, of how early this, this uh, thing has been spotted, especially for management students and for all of us together. I'd like to dwell upon the topic and that's why I got really very, very interested in this conference. Uh, growth, innovation, uh, sustainability, wellness and happiness. Uh, I cannot think of uh, you know, a more, I would say complex uh, you know, set of uh, things put together and, and they do not really work well as a team. I will share my experience with you. When we talk about growth, it is generally about growth in revenues, growth in profits, growth in market share, growth in shareholder wealth or whatever we call it as growth, in, at least my part of the business. When we talk about um, innovation, though, that's something else altogether. And I think I would like to you know, wish all of the young people who are going to go and make your careers in the future to tell you a, a very, I would say, non-popular truth is that innovation is not welcome. It is generally, initially, always uh, a hindrance to me. So uh, an example of, you know, very classic global example of that is the, the global company 3M, which I'm sure all of us know, the makers of those sticky yellow notes. Uh, the, the secret behind that glue which actually binds or you know, comes off very easily was an error. It was an error committed by someone who was trying to formulate a new type of glue. And then they realized that the glue doesn't really stick. So it was a failure. But actually someone with the right kind of thinking made an application of that error into something which is a world beating success. So what we really need is an acceptance of errors, an acceptance of mistakes, an acceptance of understanding that everything the world has produce and will produce ever, will have some purpose. So the point is to figure out what the purpose is. And generally, when we come with knowledge, when we come with what we think we know, we do not see the wood for the trees. And I think this is something very important to highlight now, that growth and innovation, while they may be put together in a sentence, uh, 
may not necessarily mean the same thing. And I think what we need to generate is our thinking about these concepts and allow for these different ideas and concepts to be put together in a team like this. And that's why, again, my congratulations to, to Dr. Jaipuria, to, to Mr. Jaipuria for this, this wonderful, uh, I would say, confluence of concepts. When I go to the third one, which is sustainability and which uh, Mr. Mukul Rajan really, really spoke a lot about and his fantastic experience so far has really uh, been the benefit of all of us to, to, to share, is to understand that sustainability and growth really are at logarithms, uh, if not, uh, not really, I would say, complementary. So the fact is that, uh, and especially I as a practitioner, and, and he mentioned a, a lot of these global asset managers, which I consider HFPC also as one, who are committed to climate change and to be able to transition from where we are to where we are going to be. My argument is that we are talking about end states. We're talking about a time when all of this will be okay. But the transition is going to be very painful. For the fact, and as uh, our uh, you know, esteemed chief guest spoke about the fact that we need oil. Uh, we will continue to burn fossil fuels and we will continue to do that for a long time. For the sustainability of our growth for, for what India wants to be $5 trillion in some time as a GDP nation. So which means that there is a lot of complexity so when we look at growth, when we look at innovation, and we look at sustainability together, there are always times that we will need to bring our hearts and minds to the conversation rather than being very adamant we are saying this is right and that is wrong. And many times I find that internally when we speak about this globally in our group as well as I'm sure in most of these investing companies, is that where do we draw the line? Do I say that I will not allocate capital uh, to these businesses which are in transition, which are showing some sort of uh, path towards this transition, uh, uh, at least give them the capital to ensure that they get there. Because if you dry them off of capital right away by having some sort of a standard feature about what is right and what is wrong, I think we're going to have a bigger crisis later on. And we are going to have a very, very bipolar world. So my encouragement to all of you is that you guys are going to actually handle these problems. We can only show you the path to where we are supposed to go. But how do you resolve this for yourself? For example, if you start your career in any of these companies and you're faced with these dilemmas, I don't think anyone is going to give you the answers. I don't think anyone is capable of giving you the answers simply because the answers don't exist today. But I would encourage you to focus on well-being and happiness in that team level because it is really out of our inner thought processes, our inner selves, our hearts, that where the solutions are going to come from. They are not going to come from the outside. And I'm going to quote the, the guide of the Heartfulness Meditation uh, Institute, which I'm a part of and I've been meditating for the last 20 years, is to show you that these answers, unless we really contemplate on it ourselves, they will never be answers which we will be coming. And I will uh, share, you know, one of his quotes that he mentioned that if you talk about intellect, you know, because that is rewarded highly in, in our world today, uh, that intellect has to really be sheathed or coached to think the right way. And that guidance has to come from the heart. And the example he gave is that suppose you are a highly gifted chemical entity and you've figured out a fantastic way of synthesizing your chemical. If you do not spend time on understanding what the effluence of that process is going to do, your buddhi is brushed, your intelligence is corrupted. And I think when I heard that sentence for the first time, I, I really suddenly realized that we really need a balance in how we think about the future, about what is right, what is good for progress, what is good for growth, and what essentially is good for all of us to do. And I think that's the reason why a country like India, which uh, came out with the concept of Vasudeva Kutumbaka, which means that the whole world is my family. Family, as in you know, being part of a family, not just a village together, is very, very important for us to remember. And I think when we put all of these together, individual practices like meditation become absolutely important. And I think many times in a corporate world and an academic world, these things are not taken very seriously. I am hoping for a time where they become the essence. For example, every meeting should start with a centering exercise. We are always bringing intent into a meeting. 
we already have decided what we want to say, what we want to speak, and then either we debate different our positions. And we take it as a personal loss if our individual position loses its concept in that meeting. And I think this is something which we should come over to say, what is the intent of the meeting? Where do you want to go? And then bring all of these diverse concepts together and then come towards a solution. Because unless it's a shared solution, there will always be somebody's success in somebody's way. And we don't want to go there. We don't want to have people who are left behind because they failed to either convey a concept to us or they thought that the concept was out of date. I think it is very important for all of us to participate in this individual exercise of contemplation, of inter introspection, which is greatly aided by something that we call as meditation. Uh, my institute offers, uh, you know, in fact, I was introduced as someone who comes from HSBC, but I would rather like to be introduced as someone who is passionate about meditation. Uh, and, and I really uh, am part of an NGO which, which teaches meditation. And many times people say, well, what do you mean to <laughs> teach meditation? It's, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, and, and I think you need guidance. And the process that we have in, in Heartfulness is a way where anyone, any newcomer, any young person, old person, whoever wishes to try for whatever they're willing to, to do, a guided way of really truly meditating. Because unless you really reach that innermost core of your heart, you haven't meditated. You just sat there and think that you have meditated. So I think it's something of tremendous use, especially for, for managers, for students who aspire to be managers, who aspire to manage people, concepts and ideas together and come to some conclusion. But unless you have that conscience inside of you, unless you understand that the solution is something which you do not know today, and to have the maturity to understand that the solution will eventually evolve is something which is essential for all of the youth. So I think uh, you know the, the end of my keynote will really come from the fact that the word youth is extremely important. Uh, all of the knowledge of the world is wasted if the youth does not participate in that exercise. And, and I exhort all of you, and I already think that your esteemed institution is well on its way because they've started to introduce these concepts to students and getting a lot of these people, thought leaders, to share their ideas so that they can think in the right way. Because thinking is the basis for everything that will evolve eventually. We think that for a year. And if that thinking is not set right at the start, we we'll only end up going to have problems and, and things which will not be able to be solved at any later stage. Uh, which I feel and I suspect the climate change problem has become. Nobody thought about it. And I think just as the way of the last example I will give is that initially what we thought was good has turned out to be bad. But that's not something that we get to, to really get disheartened. I think all what we need to do is to say, well, we've learned something. Now let us learn something more and go towards something which, which will benefit everyone together in the same way. It's not always possible. There will always be gives and takes. But I think the larger good is something which we all need to always focus on. Whether we are in academia, whether we are in, in competition, in, in industry, whether it be in asset management, wherever we go, it is something that we need to absolutely be, be very cognizant of. And I must say that mistakes uh, are something to really welcome. Uh, they are something that we should acknowledge is a way of learning something new. It's difficult, but how do you get that mental strength to accept that I was wrong, I made a mistake? Uh, it really comes from an inner sense, an inner understanding of who I am and what I can contribute and how much I know. And the more and more we tell ourselves that I really don't know much, we will be on our way. Uh, rather than saying, okay, I've got this degree and now I, you know, I'm so much and, and I know so much. I should only see that I now know more of what I don't know. It's something which we take us there. So I again, with the bottom of my heart, thank all of the organizers uh, and I really wish all of you all the very best in our endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for highlighting the meditation-based happiness and well-being for the youth.